These days, I wouldn't consider myself a Star Wars fan. These days, uh, I wouldn't consider myself to be a Star Wars fan. I don't think that's a controversial opinion. A lot of people who were big fans of Star Wars have fallen out of love with the franchise over the decade or so since the Mouse Overlord took the reins and flew the proverbial sleigh into the side of a mountain. I'm not going to sit here and tell you the pieces of Star Wars media I liked and the ones that I didn't like because, well, I mean, everybody does that, but there's also too much stuff and it's incredibly divisive and it makes people angry. Plus, it's not really relevant, although I will take this time to plug my Obi-Wan video. That show kidnapped my wife, shot my kids, and strapped me to a chair while it whipped my balls like that one scene from Casino Royale. Actually, no, it was exactly like that scene from Casino Royale. Do you, do you get the joke? <laughs> Stupid. And so look, my point here is that I'm not a Star Wars fan. I don't watch every new season of The Mandalorian or Bad Batch. I don't brush up on the extended canon. I probably won't even watch the next trilogy of movies. But when there is something remarkable that comes along, that happens to also be within the universe of Star Wars, like Andor was, I will check it out. I'm not totally stubborn. Jedi Fallen Order was one such game, and while it was derivative in a lot of ways, a Souls-like Metroidvania Uncharted Zelda mashup with a Star Wars coat of paint, it was a very competent Souls-like Metroidvania Uncharted Zelda mashup with a Star Wars coat of paint, and for that, I enjoyed my time with it. Coupled together, the fact the game made you feel good, was well designed, had a story that connected well with the mythos of Star Wars, and had strong character theming, and you've got yourself a game worth your time. Was it the greatest game I've ever played? No, not by any means. But it was fun, it was earnest, and it was worthwhile. It built a foundation that absolutely could be, and needed to be, built on with a sequel. It was begging for the developers to have another shot and see where they could take things. And of course, EA, with their wallets brimming full of money, so much so that it was rolling on the floor, tipped Respawn their hats and said, we're running out, make us more. <laughs> Fallen Order, despite the substance being strong, however, the game itself wasn't entirely, uh, let's say polished. Plenty of people suffered from a myriad of performance issues and bugs. The game was pretty damn fucked, even upon my replay just a few weeks ago in prep for Survivor, I suffered a lot of issues, which proves that patches are sort of like band-aids. Usually, you're just patching up what is a sinking ship in the hopes that it'll stay together long enough that you can make it home and work on a new ship that'll be bigger, better, and not have giant holes in the hull. However, Jedi Survivor was released in much the same condition. Now look, I didn't have many issues with this game, and that's no excuse for the poor condition of it. Regardless of my pretty decent experience, the game did launch in a disastrous state, particularly on PC, and to that I hold up my middle finger to EA and call them names, because there really isn't much else I can do from my office in the United Kingdom. But it is a shame. No developer wants their game to be released in this state, unless you work for Ubisoft, in which case I believe you genuinely enjoy making bad things to upset me personally. People have seen bugs galore, frame rate tanking, graphics bugging out, and in some cases, glitches that allow you to totally break the game in half. I played the game on PS5 in quality mode. I did try the performance mode, and it ran at 900p with a frame rate that constantly fluctuated between 40 and 60 FPS, just sort of vaguely in that ballpark. It's not good. Quality mode, however, aimed for rescaling the image resolution to 4K-ish and running at 30 FPS, which it did. It was smooth other than a few occasions where it dipped, but on the whole, it was a smooth 30. I'm not a big frame rate guy. I can handle 30 FPS. I've played 30 FPS all my life. I prefer 60. I also think games should offer a stable 60, especially on PS5 and Series X, and even more especially on PC. And in that context, I see Jedi Survivor as deeply disappointing. And for a lot of players, it's ruined the entire experience, which is absolutely a valid criticism of the product. However, it wasn't an intention of the game. All you can really criticize is that it shouldn't be in this state, which is true, but it's not the same as a mechanic being designed in a poor way, or a level not being built in a way that's engaging. It's more a criticism aimed at EA to stop being a shit company and let developers have more time to improve their video games for God's sake. 
The major issues I experienced were more on the graphical side. You can see the rescaling in action with ghosting in darker areas behind the movement and it becoming more blurry the more that's going on. It's not incredibly detrimental, but it is very noticeable in some areas. Whereas when you look at Final Fantasy VII Remake or Horizon Forbidden West, it's a totally different story. Look, I'm not Digital Foundry, so I can't tell you why it's doing this or the actual issues. <laughs> All I can tell you is that sometimes it looked a bit funny and that wasn't good, but it didn't actually harm the overall experience of the video game for me. And I want to discuss the substance outside of the issues with bugs and performance because while there are issues and yes they absolutely are worth criticizing talking about the actual content of the game itself i feel is a lot more interesting from you know the perspective that i make videos plus i didn't really have any major issues so there's not really much to truly tell from my position. I'm going to structure this video a little bit differently to what I normally do. I like to mix things up from time to time. So let's discuss the opening of the game with a few spoilers in there if you want to skip over it to set the scene, then delve into the mechanics and then return back to the story to talk about the plot, the themes, the character arc and then the ending as well, which obviously will be full of spoilers too. Use the timestamps to navigate to where you want to navigate to. It's it's absolutely up to you. Sound good? Uh, good. Let's begin. Also, a big thank you to EA for providing me with a code for this game. Receiving codes never affects how I talk about a game, but of course I have to note it nonetheless. Um, so without further ado, let's jump in. Although, 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 hang on a second. Aren't you going to ask me what's with, what's with the glasses? What is it with the glasses? I can see! Because listen, if you and I are similar, and I'm going to jump to the conclusion and suggest that you and I are in fact similar, which means both of us do a hell of a lot of staring at screens. And look, we're not changing our habits, habits that can continuously cause eye strain, itchy eyes, headaches, trouble falling asleep, and in some cases, dizziness, all because of the blue light we absorb from our screens. We want to continue staring at screens, right? Well, that's why this video is sponsored by GMG Performance Glasses. Let me tell you, I had issues. Well, I mean, I still do have issues with insane headaches and dizziness. It was just making my life a damn misery. And look, these glasses aren't a perfect fix to get rid of all of your health issues. But goddamn, when I had no other options back in 2021, there's a reason why I wore glasses for the entirety of my Persona 5 playthrough and my AC1 speedrun. And those were these shitty, cheap glasses with the awfully aggressive yellow tint on them. I thought that would be a bit more dramatic, to be honest with you. GMG has high quality, stylish glasses like these. I know. I look incredible. And they also protect against blue light and lower the chances of any of the symptoms I talked about before. They'll reduce your eye strain, they'll improve your concentration and focus, they'll help you preserve sleep quality, and they'll absolutely get you laid. I mean, they look great, right? This is a sponsor it was easy to say yes to because I've lived with these problems and experienced that blue light glasses can genuinely help you. Like I said, they're not going to fix all of your problems. I had to get medicated to actually fix my problems at the root cause, but they definitely helped the symptoms. Hit the link in the description and grab yourself some of these glasses at 40% off for the next 48 hours, no less. That's pretty huge. I personally wouldn't want to miss out. I am a sucker for a good sequel. I've talked about this before, and Jedi Survivor is absolutely a sequel in the way that it should be. The original game's narrative is of direct consequence to this one, and we're following a story that picks up where the previous left off. We experience a cinematic recap opening with gorgeous visual style as it fills us in on the story we played in 2019. Having just come out of a replay of the original, this was doubly nice, as it was almost a tribute or an ode to the story that I'd just finished up, with characters I'd re-familiarised myself with and whose stories I'd just concluded. I love when games do this, it's really never not great, but it's not just from the perspective of seeing a well put together sequence that recaps the events of a game that you loved, but on a more basic level, it means that the game you're about to play isn't one of the classic anyone can jump in with this entry sort of games. Sure, while you probably could just play Jedi Survivor and have a good time, it is absolutely designed as a follow-up and a sequel to Fallen Order, and playing that first is always going to give you a better experience. Sequels that try to accommodate new players rather than working as actual sequels to the original thing are never going to be as good to me. From the recap, we're thrust into a mission in which we follow our protagonist, Cal Kestis, as he walks the streets of Coruscant, a prisoner. 
This segment of the game allows us to immerse ourselves in a world we'll be spending the next 20 to 30 hours in. Through passive dialogue, they manage to build a sense of where the world is five years on from Fallen Order. The Empire has a tighter grip, and Cal is currently working for Saw Gerrera as a part of the Partisans, working to push back the Empire before the formation of the Rebel Alliance. It turns out, however, in a twist nobody saw coming, that it was all a setup. Cal is working with a few Resistance fighters who've dressed themselves up as Coruscant police to get close to a particular senator who would have information on the Empire's current position within the galaxy and help them to combat it. What ensues from Cal's escape is a wonderful linear progression with set pieces throughout as you navigate to gain access to the senator's yacht to retrieve the information. I've seen a decent bit of chatter about this bit online as well, saying that it's bad game design because the stormtroopers are scripted to not hit you while you're climbing on that beam. And I mean, to that, that's... <laughs> what? If they couldn't hit you in combat where there's supposed to be skill involved in the gameplay, then I would agree that's bad. But during a set piece where all you're doing is shimmying to the right, do we even have to explain why it's stupid as a criticism? Don't even have to explain. That's fucking dumb. That's so dumb. It's like saying that there should be skill involved in a fucking cutscene. What are we talking about? That piece of game design exists so that you feel like you're interacting with a story moment. Not not so that you can show the world how good you are at holding the right on the analog stick. <laughs> If you could get shot while shimmying across that pipe, then it would break the immersion of that scene because it would be completely inconsistent. And sure, it would be slightly more realistic, you would actually be avoiding those shots, but some players would get hit, some players wouldn't. It would cause frustration, but with absolutely no benefit to the player whatsoever, other than they're actually aiming at you. So it's that guy going for it. <laughs> Cal has a bit of a jaded edge to him, something that was particularly missing in Fallen Order. A lot of people criticise Cal for being one note shallow and a bit of a boring character as the core cast that surrounded him, particularly Seer, were far more interesting. Cal just didn't have enough depth, and while I do agree Cal was somewhat shallow in that first game, there was enough depth with his Order 66 trauma, guilt and regret to keep me engaged, especially on a replay, already understanding his mental state and the way it was baked into the progression of gameplay, relearning force moves was a nice addition that connected me more with this character and his own personal journey. That said, it's nice to see Cal with a bit more about him five years on. He's confident, maybe to a fault at points, and seems to have a greater sense of the universe at large. He's clearly grown up and is a lot more sharp, witty, and generally charismatic. A lot of that might come across as typical. Disney does love a good quippy protagonist these days, however I feel that what they proceed to do with Cal justifies it feeling typical at first, and it ends up adding greater depth to his mental state, similar to what they do by the end of Fallen Order. This level itself is gorgeous and well designed, from the backdrop of Coruscant to the streets themselves with the lights and atmosphere, they work so well to ground you in the space you're moving through, and the game really is gorgeous. Coruscant was a perfect starting point, not just as the centre of the Empire to begin building your world from, but as a space to get the player hooked and show off their graphics to make you feel part of something bigger. On a gameplay front, which we'll talk about in more detail later, it starts you off with everything you had from the previous game's ending, which is really nice. No resetting to level 1. Cal has his single-bladed lightsaber as well as a double-bladed stance as well. Double jumps and wall runs are also present, making the traversal feel seamless between finishing Fallen Order and beginning Survivor, which I think is a nice touch that allows it to feel even more like the next step in the same journey. This opening level feels like the best of Fallen Order's level design, but taken to another level. The interconnected level design, the collectibles off the beaten path, the clever use of environment to allow organic traversal. I found myself just smiling as I moved around like a big fucking loser because this game had reeled me in and hooked me like a fish about to be pulled from its home and gutted before being battered, dropped in boiling oil, and fried to perfection. Sorry. I'm just really hungry. <laughs> As you progress, we meet our first major character, a new guy called Bode, who's voiced by the guy who does Cthulhu in Horizon Forbidden West, which was really fun. What took you so long? That was an unkind comparison. And I called it right here, by the way. I wish I'd been streaming or recording, but as soon as I saw him, I said to myself, he's gonna betray us at the end of the game. The reason I knew isn't necessarily a bad thing. I don't think it's telegraphed through poor writing. I actually think it's telegraphed through good writing. When it happened, I actually went, yes, I fucking knew it. 
rather than being disappointed that I knew what was going to happen. The moment he told Cal about his daughter is what solidified it for me. Why would you be telling us this if it wasn't going to be used as emotional ammunition to justify something later in the story? This is also, however, where you pick up the Ascension Cable. This thing I love using. This thing is awesome. It really makes you feel like Batman. You use it to grapple onto glowing blue points at the edges of ledges and zip to them. The animation Cal does as he climbs up from a lower point is really great too, just a little sideways flip, it's always satisfying. The grapple is also used to string together movement, such as using it to zip to a wall run point in the early game. The way Survivor uses movement mechanics and combines them is honestly masterful, and we'll discuss them in depth later on. But once you start to pick up more and more moves, it becomes one of the most complex and fun systems I've ever had the pleasure of playing. As you arrive at the yacht, you're greeted by your other crewmates, clearly implying the original Fallen Order crew split up some time ago, indicating where Cal's jaded nature comes from. From. After losing his master to the purge and finally finding a sense of belonging, it makes sense that he's throwing himself headfirst into his work to fight back rather than dwelling on the fact that he's lost his found family in Seer, Grease, and Merin, only BD1 stuck by his side. It's a common symptom of PTSD to do the only thing you know you're good at to avoid revisiting the pain and trauma. It's a coping mechanism. I don't want to pile on more depth than is actually here, but it's clear that Cal is not yet over what happened to him. That loss is a part of him and always will be, and so when he finds himself alone again, what he's doing right now makes a hell of a lot of sense. But it also plays into the core themes by the end of the game, and it's all done in this opening mission through implication more than anything else. Once making our way aboard the yacht, we're able to confront Deho Sajan. Using a mind trick, a new basic mechanic that serves as fake dialogue options that to my knowledge change nothing about the actual interaction, we're able to access his terminal. We discover that the Empire is everywhere, their strength only grows and only a few systems are free of their influence and oppression. This is obviously bad news. Cal's reaction to this also speaks volumes as to where his character is at, once again reinforcing the central themes. Sajan suggests submission as a form of self-preservation really isn't that bad. The Empire is too strong and cannot be defeated. Cal at this point tries to quell his anger and present himself as a Jedi, as a beacon of hope, but is he trying to convince the Senator or himself? Things don't go entirely to plan here, however. The Empire and Inquisitors show up, and when they do, they take out multiple people from Cal's squad. Gab, who was one of my favourites, dies right next to him. She and the others were so well characterised, I assumed they would have been potential new crewmates for the Mantis, but no. They work to build up these characters as compelling people, and then just rip them away. But this acts as more than just basic shock, because it works to explore Cal himself. In this moment, he ignites his lightsaber, and despite the calls to come back from his crew, he decides to fight. You can see the anger in his eyes, years of fighting the Empire, and yet they can still take everything from him in seconds, just like they did during Order 66. This is the first point in which we see the potential for Cal to embrace a darker side. He's emotionally driven, and in embracing that, he finds it harder to remain true to the traditional Jedi code, and plays into something Seer said in Fallen Order, that every Jedi eventually grapples with the dark side. What ensues next is a boss fight with the Ninth Sister, one of the Inquisitors we fought in Fallen Order, and was really the first truly tough fight of that game, if we ignore uh, Ogdo Bogdo, who uh, still haunts my dreams. <laughs> Having the Ninth Sister as the first boss of Survivor not only works as gameplay reinforcing the idea that the Empire are unstoppable, given she's a boss from the previous game that we thought we'd killed, but also works to show how far Cal has come. In Fallen Order, this boss is tough, and you don't even kill her. In Survivor, it's the tutorial boss, and you defeat her with a little effort. It's subtle, and I like that about it. We'll talk about the intricacies and mechanics of boss fights later, but this acts as a really nice introduction that is mechanically sound. It isn't groundbreaking, which can be said for most of Fallen Order and a decent bit of Survivor too, but it is fun and it's designed well, which you can't scoff at no matter how run-of-the-mill it might be. Her attacks are well telegraphed and the story weight of the fight considerably improves the tension of it, and Jedi Survivor continues to do what Fallen Order did so well, making the act of swinging a lightsaber elevate the combat system to a height it wouldn't have without it. Were these just swords, it would be very obvious it was a Souls or Sekiro clone, and a pretty average one at that, but when and their lightsabers? The joy is immense. The feeling of connecting it with another, of landing the right strike to sever limbs. The sound design, the ignition, the hum and the clash. It's a novelty, but it's one I love so much, and it transforms the combat into something grander just by being. 
and they know it too. During the fight, you unlock your third lightsaber stance, dual wield. The stance was relegated to specific attacks in Fallen Order, but in Survivor, it's a whole stance like single-bladed and double-bladed, which is incredibly satisfying to use. But we'll talk more about the stance system in depth in a bit. We learn here that the Knight Sister was also a Jedi like Cal before Order 66. Like every Jedi Cal has met since the Purge other than Seer, she turned to the dark side, which is something that plays on Cal's mind continuously, as it did with Trilla and Taran Malakos, and will do later in the story with Dagon and Bode. There's a running theme of Cal feeling isolated. Every Jedi he meets seems to be twisted and he's just floating through the galaxy with no real purpose, but trying his best to find something and that manifests as a constant fight against a seemingly unstoppable force. Futility. Once defeated, our goal is to escape to the Mantis and get off this planet. Meeting back up with Bode and Bravo, the only two left from our initial group, we make our way to the ship we have on loan from Grease and finally make our escape. Being back on board the Mantis is a bittersweet feeling. It's the home we'd gotten so used to in Fallen Order, but now there's nobody aboard but Cal and BD-1. None of Grease's cooking, no talks with Seer or snarky remarks from Merrin. It's a shell of what it was, now that everyone's left. The cutscene that follows is tense and well-directed, like something ripped straight from one of the films. A few rebel ships navigating a tight passageway to make their escape, pursued by TIE fighters, taking casualties along the way. Bravo is gone. Now only Cal and Bode remain from the crew that went on this mission. Too many lives have been lost to make such a small dent in the Empire. Bode breaks away to take some of the pressure off Cal and he punches it to light speed to escape the Empire. For now. The Mantis, however, is badly damaged, and they need it repaired if they're to continue this crusade. And who better to repair the Mantis than the man who it belonged to? Grease Dritus, who now owns a saloon out in the Kobo system, on an outer rim planet home to an interesting array of flora and fauna, as well as the Bedlam Raiders. However, somewhere tucked out of the way is a small settlement called Rambler's Reach, and this is where Cal can find Grease. After landing on the planet, this is where the game begins to truly open up to you, and is where we can also begin to discuss the gameplay mechanics, systems, and design of levels, among plenty of other things. I have a lot to say regarding the story itself, but we'll save that for later. The world of Star Wars is extensive and offers so much room for growth and expansion of what already exists, but you often find films or shows retreading familiar ground, sometimes figuratively in planets just slightly resembling what came before and often literally retreading old ground. But it's not just that, it's the fact that characters seem to cross over constantly. You can't go anywhere in the Star Wars universe without seemingly bumping into a major character and it acts to make the Star Wars universe feel tiny and often breaks your immersion with it. It's one of the biggest props I can give to the prequels. As bad as they are as films, and yep, they're still bad, even if you grew up with them and think they're good now for some reason, the one thing they nailed is building out the galaxy and making it feel tonally different prior to the fall of the Republic and rise of the Empire. One of the biggest immersion-breaking things about the sequels, other than the fact they're catastrophic pieces of film, if you can even call them film, is that they just feel like the original trilogy, but... Again, though. First Order is Empire, Resistance is Rebellion, and none of it feels fleshed out, explored, explained, or grounded in any sort of genuine logic that allows one to feel immersed, which is what was so compelling about Clone Wars. It often lent on things being brand new, planets we'd never seen, people we'd never met, cultures to discover and learn of. A lot of what we now consider to be core to the Star Wars universe in places like Dathomir and Ryloth is because of Clone Wars deciding to expand things into new territory. I find that Jedi Fallen Order, and to a greater extent Jedi Survivor, do this in droves. The world is designed so that you feel like a smaller part of a much larger whole. Kobo feels like a new interesting world within a ginormous galaxy of opportunity and potential. But not just that, on a macro level it feels immersive. By allowing you to speak to the people around Rambler's Reach in the town or the saloon, get to know this small community over the course of the game, you feel like this is just a small corner of something bigger. There are pockets of small communities like this all over the galaxy with very real and genuine people people with their own struggles and stories to tell, their own history. This is even more important in a world that is being continuously oppressed by the Galactic Empire. People aren't allowed to express themselves, it's dangerous to fall out of line, and so finding a small ranch on a planet like this in the Outer Rim just feels so grounding, 
Star Wars has never felt this immersive, not since the first time we left our family home with a young and ambitious farmer to discover the wonders of Mos Eisley in a bid to leave the planet and save the galaxy. The immersion here is only added to with the killer soundtrack as you explore any of the locations within the game. Kobo being a larger explorable area is an interesting twist on what they did previously within Jedi Fallen Order. Usually these planets were all Souls-like linear levels with interesting geometry to navigate and intersecting paths for shortcuts and exploration. Kobo, however, as well as Jeddah, have large open spaces to explore, similar to something like God of War, closer perhaps to the way that it's handled in Ragnarok with locations like Alfheim. Where in Kobo, I felt it worked seamlessly to integrate the game's signature level design into a space that felt grand and explorable, Jeddah fell slightly more flat. The example of Alfheim wasn't random, it feels similar in a lot of ways and is not only slightly lesser than the exploration of Kobo, but I would say it often starts to break your immersion as you navigate across a large desert to obvious points of interest, all of which seem to have similar puzzles or things to do. Sometimes there are green shield barriers in front of cave entrances that seemingly have nothing of note behind them worth putting a shield barrier in front of, not from a game design perspective, but from an in-universe perspective. I kept asking myself, who put this here? Why are there soldiers over there? It feels almost too video gamey for a video game that usually gets this sort of thing incredibly right. Kobo is a great example of expanding your level design to accommodate a mini open world in a way that serves gameplay, story, and the context of your place in it. Jeddah isn't. It didn't destroy my experience of the game, nor should it, but it did feel out of place compared to how literally every other location in the game was handled. I think this comes back to the point I made within the Ragnarok video. Open worlds in games, to be compelling, have to have some sort of contextual justification. Even though I got a lot of comments on that video telling me I was wrong, I wasn't really wrong. You just disagree about whether it was justified contextually. I feel that it wasn't, and you feel like it was, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be justified contextually. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who think that Jeddah was justified contextually, I just don't. Kobo justifies its open world by it being your home base. You want to explore, you want to meet new people, it feels personal and worthwhile. Jeddah's open world, however, is separate from the main content of events happening, and it feels like this random side place that's somewhat tacked on to the game. It's sort of similar in a way to how New Austin was included in Red Dead Redemption 2, just this random huge area to explore and find things in, but where nothing actually happens. The difference, however, is in Red Dead Redemption 2, it's used as an empty space to evoke a feeling from the player as they wander that region. In Survivor, Jeddah is used as extra content padding to make it feel like there's more to do which, while there is, the lack of meaningful context for the player takes away from it, in my experience. Because of these larger spaces to explore, the game introduces mounts in the Nekos, Spammels, and in very particular locations, Relters, to glide from a high point and get you back into the action as quickly as possible. The Nekos help you to navigate faster across the larger areas of Kobo, as well as giving you a jump boost in some particular puzzles. Spammels do the same, but on Jeddah. They're easily tamed and can be called in from wherever you are on the map. And while it's a nice little addition to navigate, it's, again, far better implemented on Kobo than on Jeddah. You're going to be using them for small periods and then for integral puzzles on Kobo, but on Jeddah, you're going to be spending a decent amount of time just riding in a straight line with the Spammels, and I think it speaks to something that was also prominent in Jedi Fallen Order. Some aspects of the design are clearly very meticulous and perfected, whereas other aspects feel compromised, and I think the disparity between exploration on Kobo and Jeddah does speak to that. But it's not just the very general design that makes Kobo more compelling as an open space, it's the fact that it's so very alive. There are tons of random NPCs, some named and some not, and there are plenty of quests for you to pick up. When you meet up with Grease at his saloon, Pyloon's saloon, you sort of become an unofficial owner of the place too. By speaking to the locals, you pick up rumours, and these rumours allow you to recruit new people from all over Kobo into your saloon. They range from totally random background NPCs to full-blown characters like the fisherman Skuva Stev, the musicians Ashi Javi and DD Isi, or the Hollow Tactics gamblers Bima and Thule all of which are interesting aliens that I've never seen before in Star Wars, adding once again to the sense of making the universe feel genuinely big. New things are around every corner, rather than the same five main races we see in every piece of Star Wars media. And who can forget the main man himself, Turgle? I don't usually love these gimmick characters, but 
Turgle worked on me. I love this guy. I'm sure once Disney picks up on his popularity and milks him dry like an infomaniac to a hedonist, I'll feel differently. Don't get me wrong, the NPCs are still somewhat shallow in areas. I wouldn't necessarily give a shit if any of them were to die, I didn't have a strong emotional connection to any of them, but they do act as a way to ground you and give you some sort of sense of place in the wide universe, and I do appreciate it as that entity. As well as the fact that as the game progresses and as you gain more friends, it starts to feel more alive and more active and social. There's a real sense of progression as you gather people for the saloon, and not only to occupy space, but also provide interesting things for you to take part in, such as gathering fish for the fish tank, seeds for gardening, or just the music in the saloon, or the hollow gains for rewards, and we'll talk more about these elements a little bit later on. I would have liked to have seen this go deeper though. It feels like the start of a system that could have been so much more. A true town building system that you invest into, allowing you to spend in-game currency to open shops and make the town look nicer, similar to something like Monteregioni from Assassin's Creed 2. Instead, the progression is semi-passive, with your only real contributions being to gather new people and invite them to live in Rambler's Reach, as well as the fishing and seed collecting, but other than that, there's not much more to it. It's something I didn't ever think I needed, but after playing Survivor, it's something I really would have liked, especially to help it feel even more personal to Cal and the player, because as it stands, as nice as it is, it does feel somewhat like a bit of an afterthought, rather than a core part of the experience. From these large open spaces, you find yourself funneled into areas which resemble typical Fallen Order level design, but like I said before, dialed up a hell of a lot. Navigating the levels of each planet in Fallen Order was fun and intuitive, it never felt like it was tedious other than when the game would force you to retread all of your steps to return to the ship, or on second visits to reach a new area from the ship. Thankfully, Jedi Survivor allows fast travel between bonfires, sorry, uh, meditation points. They're absolutely not bonfires. And this means the placement of bonfire. Fuck! This means the placement of meditation points is often a lot more convenient to reach various interconnected shortcuts than it was in Fallen Order, which is a very subtle improvement, but one that allows for far, far less tedium when revisiting areas, and it's a huge help. The linear areas themselves, whether side areas to explore on Kobo and Jeddah or just your main missions, are structured immaculately, and I genuinely mean that. Fallen Order would often make things appear complex, but not offer a great deal of player agency in navigating that. You'd come to realise that levels were really a lot more simple than they first appeared, given that you'd usually approach them in a very linear way, navigating the only way you could, which gave an illusion of exploration, but in reality, it was very on rails. It was a simplified version of exploring a Dark Souls level with the mechanics of Uncharted, and while fun, it could feel lacking. Jedi Survivor actually makes you engage yourself with the navigation, whether through the use of alternating pathways that often will intersect above and below the same area, to give you a sense of choice in how you approach a path, but also they manage this using the insanely improved set of movement mechanics which just transforms the way you navigate the level design. I won't say it's not derivative, as Fallen Order also was, but I think it owns it in a way that doesn't just take mechanics from another game and give them a Star Wars coat of paint. It takes mechanics and transforms them in ways that allow for it to feel unique to a Star Wars experience. There are of course elements here of traversal that will still feel like Uncharted, Prince of Persia, or Zelda, but as you unlock more, the game begins to stray further from what you're familiar with and do things that feel unique and interesting and above all, fun. Games, especially story-driven games these days, often lack the core element of being just genuinely fun, but Jedi Survivor nails it. There are plenty of games I've enjoyed my time with recently, but I don't think I've genuinely had this much pure fun with a game set of mechanics in years. The reason for this is how much the game allows you to play with the mechanics. You often feel like there are multiple ways to deal with a given scenario, and you're choosing what you feel works best. Not to mention, when you're reaching the tougher stages of the game, you're pushed into really thinking on the fly as you run across walls, dash through barriers, grapple to higher areas, and the whole time you're thinking about your next step to string together moves to complete it as efficiently as possible, but also with as much style as possible. And when it works well, it works exceedingly well, which, luckily, is most of the time. Unless you just, like, weren't paying attention and also suck. You haven't learned to fly yet, have you? Afraid not. There. See it? I really want to say I did that on purpose for the joke, but I... <laughs> 
<laughs> I didn't. <laughs> and you have by the end such a vast array of tools to better help you navigate the environment. Some of course act as abilities you will use on the fly to actually navigate such as the double jump, wall run, mid air dash, the tic tac, grapple hook, barrier dash and the grapple launch. Others, however, are used for being able to access previously closed off areas. The Kobo Mata Shooter allows you to create a trail of fire to burn through Kobo Mata, clearing a barrier across a path. The Electro Dart allows you to turn on power to doors and elevators that previously had none, and the ability to force slam and lift allows you to raise the doors or lower platforms that previously were out of reach. But all these skills aren't simply pushed into a particular box and used for very specific things. The grapple launch, for example, while a tool for moving around more efficiently, is actually an essential tool to reach higher and out-of-reach areas that previously you were unable to explore. So there's this feeling of abilities and gear being far more natural and organic. They aren't used for one specific thing, you sort of have to think outside of the box to figure out how to navigate to an area out of reach. They then take all these different abilities and work them into environmental puzzles, whether for the main story or for the shrine. sorry, not shrines, they are High Republic Chambers. They're basically just Breath of the Wild shrines, though. And what they do is allow for a space in which the game demands you think using everything you've acquired thus far in order to beat the puzzle and gain the reward. It's genuinely remarkable how well constructed these puzzle rooms are in giving you the freedom to use the navigation mechanics, and I felt time and time again like I was only completing them one of the many ways it could have been possible to complete them. And even if that's not true, and there only is one way, they did a hell of a good job at conveying the illusion that I was deciding how to win. The reason these mechanics work so well and are a great improvement from Fallen Order is mainly because of the level design itself. Everything is bigger, there are far more optional routes to take, all of which intersect and give you this general sense of exploration, especially when you see an elevator door and you know that later on you'll likely find where that leads to open a shortcut back to the origin point, or if you see a grapple point there's likely something up there that might not just be a dead end for a collectible, but might create a shortcut path to somewhere brand new, or that some optional areas with intricate designs are locked off behind these green barriers that once you can pass through enables you to discover totally new places that are set separate from the main story, but offer tons of valuable content, whether through the gameplay itself or through lore points, skill points, and sometimes you even get better hacking abilities for BD1. They manage to make every path, every twist and turn feel absolutely worth exploring by doing this, and it's genuinely masterful level design. Where Fallen Order sometimes fell flat in levels like Kashyyyk or parts of Dathomir, Survivor manages to make every single one of its linear locations engaging and damn fun to play. It's only in the open areas of Jeddah where things start to fall a little bit flat. Like, literally flat. But I can live with that. It's an area to improve on, but doesn't cause the game to fall apart, because the core gameplay, the core level design, and what you're generally engaging with is some of the most fun I've had in modern video games. This is how platforming should be tackled in a modern AAA title of this nature, and I can only imagine where they can push it next. They've got something truly special here. Every planet has its own feel and vibe, although I will be honest, I expected a little bit more at times. Often, instead of visiting a new planet, you return to Kobo to simply visit a new area, and although the areas are totally unique in a lot of cases, with Rambler's Reach being different from Dredger's Gorge, or the Forest Array being different from the Hunter's Quarry, and the insanely cool Lucahog mission, it's a shame that there aren't more unique planets. In total, we have Coruscant, Kobo, Jeddah, and the Shattered Moon. Everywhere else are small locations for brief missions with Nova Garan and Tanalor. When you contrast this with Fallen Order giving us Bagano, Zepho, Kashyyyk and Dathomir, as well as a few linear locations in Bracca, Ilum and the Fortress Inquisitorius, it feels slightly underwhelming and less of an expansive adventure to tons of different places which is a bit of a shame. They definitely try to remedy this by giving Kobo a lot of variation, but I still felt somewhat disappointed that we didn't have maybe six unique planets, because ultimately you only really have Kobo and Jeddah as genuinely explorable locations that are incredibly worth revisiting. Coruscant and the Shattered Moon can be returned to, but they're very much linear set pieces rather than a genuinely explorable place with off the beaten track areas like we saw with the planets in Fallen Order. And it does leave the game feeling a tad empty and maybe less grand than its scope or scale. But, that said, each location does build out its lore and history with little pieces of information to discover or conversations to overhear, and it does wonders to make the spaces you're moving through feel like they exist and are tangible. Whereas, in Fallen Order, some of the places felt like they were built for video games rather than them being actual places people could conceivably exist. No more of these huge slides is a very, very welcome change. 
On the other side of the gameplay coin, we have combat, something intrinsically important to Jedi Fallen Order and again to Jedi Survivor. Fallen Order combat allowed for a vague Souls-like approach which focused on dodging, timing your attacks well and retaliating, as well as having some elements of Sekiro in there too with the parry and stagger meter. Survivor follows much the same approach but expands in ways that help it to feel somewhat distinct. Don't get me wrong, the base idea is still derivative, but being derivative isn't always bad if you take mechanics and utilise them in ways that play into the strengths of the game that you're making. I felt with Fallen Order though that making the game Souls-like, while fun, doesn't truly understand why Dark Souls works. And sure, there doesn't always have to be an intrinsic link between the themes and gameplay, but when they are so important in the original thing and are not in the clones, you do start to see it a little bit more clearly. In Dark Souls, the reason it's so difficult, the reason it's about memorising level paths, the reason it's about slow and methodical play is because the premise allows for this exploration of fighting back against futility. You will die over and over again, but eventually you'll succeed just to do it all again, and it's baked directly into the world building why that is. It works together to build up this thematic sense of harmony between the story being told, the tone established, and the gameplay loop that you are engaging with. A lot of people have likened Dark Souls to a fight against depression, and I think that's a beautiful way of looking at it. As much as you're going to get knocked down and the world might seem like it's always against you, if you keep fighting, you won't lose. I love that. Jello Fallen Order didn't bake any of these mechanics into the world building or story or even their narrative theming, and so I think it's a totally valid criticism to ask the question, why exactly did they decide to make the game Souls-like? I think the answer is the most obvious one, and that's because it's fun. And it is fun. And I think that alone is why I can overlook the fact that it's nowhere near as significant to the makeup of the game as it is in Dark Souls, and I think the same can be said for all of the derivative mechanics. They aren't there for thematic reasons, they're there because they're fun, and while that's a shallow conclusion to draw, it doesn't mean they do it badly, because they don't. But I do think Jedi Survivor works to remedy this in a way that is actually quite marvellous. But I'll keep you waiting for that in the section about narrative. Sorry to whet your appetites and then pull the meal away from you. For now, let us discuss how it operates mechanically. Like I said earlier, the fact you're wielding a lightsaber immediately elevates the combat to a level above most major Souls-like games, and in this game it somehow feels more satisfying than it did in Fallen Order. You begin the game with your entire moveset from the last game, your lightsaber combos, your ability to parry incoming attacks, to stagger an opponent, or to take out a portion of their stagger meter, depending on how powerful they are, and to retaliate with your own attacks. You can deflect Stormtroopers' lasers right back at them, and it feels great. The finishing moves in this entry are far superior to Fallen Order as well, because they now allow for dismemberment of human enemies too, whereas in Fallen Order that was reserved purely for animals, and you don't quite realise the improvement it makes until you're slicing arms off of whole squads of stormtroopers. The skill trees are hugely enhanced in this entry, allowing you tons of different skills for your ability to survive, use a lightsaber, and use the force, which is far more extensive than what we saw in Jedi Fallen Order. Being able to really spec into any particular playstyle that favours you is greatly appreciated, and usually when it comes to skill trees I find certain skills to be filler or padding with the majority of important skills being few and far between, but it feels like every skill on this skill tree is near enough equal to improving the gameplay experience, and I found it endlessly fun every time I unlocked a new skill to be able to try it out at the next opportunity, which was unexpected. One of the skills I did find to be somewhat broken, however, was the single-bladed lightsaber, allowing you to perform an attack while in the air that strikes downwards at an enemy on the ground, which dealt a ton of damage, often staggering them and it could be repeated a few times in succession. It trivialised a lot of the boss fights, and once I figured it out, it was my go-to move in tougher fights that were screwing me over, which does, in some instances, allow you to ignore mechanics and simply spam it to win. I'm sure plenty of people are saying, well, you could've just not used it. But if you're gonna give me an easy win button as part of the gameplay, it would be really silly not to use it. It's up to the developers to balance things well enough that these exploits don't exist. It's not my job to not use a thing that is in the game just to make the experience better. And for the most part, they do that well. Every other ability or skill felt incredibly well balanced and had a good risk reward trade off, but this one move, it just made the game so much easier. And I'd probably say that's a little bit of an issue. The biggest addition, however, to the combat is the various stances that can be used. In Fallen Order, by the end of the game, you had single bladed, double bladed, and a special attack which would dual wield for a short period. In Survivor, you have five set stances that you unlock over the course of the game, and they alter the way that combat functions. 
single bladed, double bladed, dual wield, blaster stance, and cross guard. These stances all change the way you interact with combat. Single bladed works as a pretty well rounded tool. Average damage, average speed, average range, and average defense. It's your bog standard weapon that does everything fine, but doesn't do anything exceptionally. Double bladed acts as a way to increase your speed and defense while decreasing your power and range. Dual wield will max out your speed with a decent damage output while dropping in range and defense stats. Blaster stance will max out your range, allowing Cal to use a blaster to hit enemies from a distance. It's also decently fast with average defense, but poor damage. And finally, the crossguard stance maxes out your power and grants high defense and decent range at the cost of all of your speed, making the weapon take a while to land an attack. All of these stances are well balanced and no single stance is better than the other, it ultimately depends on your own playstyle as to which you find the best working for you. The issue with the stance system is that it's in no way baked into the actual design of combat. The different stances act as different ways to play, which are incredibly fun to mess around with due to their different moves, but you never have to use any of them. They're aesthetic more than anything else. Because you can only switch stances at a meditation spot, it means enemies can't really be made to be dealt with using any specific stance because you might not have that stance currently equipped when you arrive at a fight, meaning you'd be screwed over and would get frustrated incredibly quickly. Instead, every enemy can be dealt with using any stance. Sure, some stances are better for some situations, like the crossguard stance for large, tough bosses like Rancors, or the double-bladed stance for large, grouped-together enemies, but that's about it, and you can still deal with those situations with any other stance too. There's a great concept here, but the fact of the matter is that the enemies and the encounters aren't built in a way that pushes you to different stances, nor are they accessible enough to have the game be built that way. A simple change would be to follow in the footsteps of Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost allows for you to switch between all four stances on the fly with a combination of buttons. Different stances deal with different enemy types, and it means you have to be switching stances on the fly mid-combat to better and more efficiently deal with enemies. If you allowed us to switch mid-combat in Survivor, and open a weapon wheel of sorts to switch stances as we're fighting, it would mean you could then actually build enemy types that require you to switch stance, giving the stances far greater purpose and a strategic reason to exist. Because as things stand currently, stances really only exist for you to alter the way that you fight for aesthetic reasons, or because you like the way that it feels more, not because the game forces you to switch stance, which makes the entire system shallow. I never felt there was any need to use the crossguard stance because I enjoyed single bladed and dual wield more and they could deal with every circumstance. I did force myself to use multiple stances across my playthrough just to see what they were like, but I always found myself falling back on the two that I liked the most because there was no benefit to switching one of them out just to use a blaster or make my lightsaber swing like a greatsword outside of very, very specific circumstances where I felt dealing higher amounts of damage would make the fight efficient after tons of failed attempts. But those moments were very few and far between. In the next game, we should be able to use all the stances at once, change it on the fly. Then you can design enemies around specific stances and force me to switch to survive, making the mechanic less superficial and instead an integral part of the gameplay experience. Now, I'm well aware that Dark Souls itself allows the use of different weapon types that are better at particular things than others. It's the difference between specking into strength over dexterity. But in Souls, you can choose what type of player you want to be from the very start, and then over the course of the game, you build up that particular build with more skill points and stronger weapons. In Jedi Survivor, it isn't structured that way. Each stance has a preset statistic, and the skill tree simply unlocks more abilities to use within the combat itself. Each stance is unlocked at different points within the story of the game. If you had all five stances to choose from at the start and could spec into specific stats like strength or dexterity to improve the efficiency of particular stances, then maybe I'd understand this decision. But that's not the case. The way the game introduces and presents stances is in a way that would benefit from the Ghost of Tsushima approach, to have us utilize them for different types of scenarios. There's a good system here, it's just a bit lost in how they've executed it. On another note, a very interesting addition, however, are the companions. You do now often have people from your crew who will accompany you on missions. It's not always, and they're usually relegated to story missions or particular areas of the map, but they are very interesting and do work well as a system. They have specific skills which help Cal to better navigate areas and also act as a way to get some dialogue in, build relationships, and fill you in on little bits of character motivation or world building, which I think works nicely. 
I'm glad it's not constant because I do like the isolation of Cal and BD1 being alone. I think it works into the Souls-like formula well, but this was a welcome change of pace at points. The biggest juice they have is actually helping you within combat. The AI itself will usually just casually help you out, dealing damage to enemies or stunning them so you can go in for the kill. But on top of that, you also have the ability to direct them yourself, similar-ish to something maybe like the Guardians of the Galaxy game. This works particularly well on tougher enemies or mini-bosses, meaning you can, for example, have Merin pin the enemy down to get a better angle and deal some damage. I think this is a system that once refined and built upon could be incredibly fun in the third game. Maybe you can choose if you want to bring someone to any area, a la Mass Effect. I mean, since these games sort of cherry pick from every single player franchise, why not do Mass Effect as well? Fighting comes to a head truly when tackling the bosses though, and they are, as they were in Jedi Fallen Order, very well executed. But no more than that. They are competent bosses with well-telegraphed attacks, story weight, which always helps and are escalating in difficulty with some of the final bosses being genuinely very tricky to beat, requiring multiple tries and a memorizing of their attack patterns. While Survivor doesn't do anything hugely remarkable in terms of its boss mechanics, it's definitely more deep than Fallen Order. I felt the bosses had so many more mechanics to contend with, forcing you to play into your strengths and use the skills that you've learned to get the upper hand. Simply parrying and attacking won't really cut it, and I think that's engaging. Some of the bosses also have multiple phases now which alter their attack patterns, and I think is something again that adds to your own engagement. You have to be paying attention, and often you're going to breeze through the first phase and die in the second, only to have to tackle it all again, and it makes you play safer, learn the fight properly and win that way, rather than potentially trying to cheese it. Of all the bosses in Fallen Order, I found Taran Malikos to be the most fun and mechanically deep, with great story weight to boot. I think nearly all of the bosses in Survivor are probably better than him, so that probably speaks decently well to how I found the game to be on the boss front. There are more aspects to bosses I'll talk about later, but it'll be more relevant when discussing the narrative itself. Overall, I do think that they managed to tear the bosses apart from one another and do things with each that felt unique and make it exciting when facing off against one, especially Rick the Door Technician. I feel like it would be doubly funny if, when you replayed on New Game Plus, Rick became the hardest boss in the game to throw you through a loop or something. Where Fallen Order had little to no content outside of the main story other than returning to planets to collect everything and complete things 100%, Survivor boasts a whole slew of side content that is not only engaging but worth your time to complete. The biggest type of side contents are the rumours which function as traditional side quests. You talk to people around Kobo and they'll inform you of something in the world. Once you go there it could be anything from a new recruit for the saloon to a whole new area to explore and discover with worthwhile loot, lore and sometimes a mini story to uncover. One of my favourites was being pointed to an abandoned shack in which I found a droid who'd been locked up for a long time. In speaking to the droid and looking around some, you realise there were once people here too, but sadly, only the droid remains. You can then send him back to the saloon. If you head deeper still, you discover this large cavern with plenty to see and do inside that works as a totally optional dungeon area, and I thought that was really neat. These side quests aren't the most deep things in the world, they're hardly rivaling The Witcher 3, but what they do allow for is a context for your exploration instead of simply just doing it for the sake of doing it, which I can appreciate, and there are plenty and plenty of them to keep you running around Kobo and discovering more. Bounties are in a similar vein, a character in the saloon known as Kaige, Cage. Cage. <laughs> a bloody rootin' tootin' Australian cowboy. Lady. It she is. Will give you tips on where to find bounty hunters that are likely searching for you. Which also comes with a hierarchy tree like you're hunting down the Order of Ancients in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Which did give me a brief moment of post-traumatic stress disorder. But I promise I'm mostly fine now. In hunting these guys down, they provide a fun boss battle for you, while also rewarding you with a bounty puck that you can use to trade with Cage for some unique items, and we'll talk more about trading and items in a sec. Bounties are fun. I like that it grounds them in the context for the world and uses characters as a means to provide them, because Cage is also really cool. Tracking down these named bounty hunters across Kobo felt fun, and I enjoyed how it was framed. The fight themselves vary and can genuinely be tough at times, which was definitely welcome. There are plenty of other legendary boss fights across the game as well, which was something I really enjoyed, from rancors to lightsaber-wielding raiders to the fucking spawn of Ogdo. I always felt when I came up against one of these, it was about to be an incredibly tense fight that I'd barely scraped through, but it was deeply satisfying to overcome. These fights are the sort of in-game challenges for combat that Fallen Order needed, and they're such a welcome addition to the game to give you something to aim for after finishing the 
main story. Another good way to utilize the core gameplay to provide a challenge is with the little challenge room force echo things. You'll stumble across these little fragmented memories all over the place on different planets, and by accessing them, Cal will enter a fragmented memory. They're sometimes a fight challenge and sometimes movement challenges. Fight challenges will throw particular enemies at you and ask you to defeat them in a particular way as to match the memory Cal is reliving. My favorite though were these movement challenge ones. They really showcase the versatility of the movement system in the game and push you to get good at it. The amount of interweaving of moves you have to think of on the fly is glorious, and I had to try most of these multiple times to learn the level and eventually pull off this insane cacophony of moves to reach the end. I love this. This was made just for me, and I cannot speak highly enough of this piece of side content. The last major piece of side content you'll uncover are the High Republic Ruins, which are just essentially Breath of the Wild shrines. I mentioned them earlier in the video. There are six of these all around Kobo, and they provide different environmental puzzles to complete, all of which are deeply complex and require trial and error to solve. Most of the main story puzzles in Fallen Order, other than maybe the couple of tombs you visit as part of the main story, are solved just by progressing in a linear fashion around the environment. The puzzle sort of reveals itself to you. There's no element of being given a set of tools and then working out how they fit together. Survivor does remedy this as part of the main story with a lot of its puzzle sections, but on top of that, these High Republic chambers are the antithesis to Jedi Fallen Order. These really test your current skills, your ability to assess an environment and find a solution using all of the tools available. They're absolutely derivative of Breath of the Wild, but I don't think I've seen a game take a mechanic from another game and execute it so very well. The High Republic Ruins also provide a really nice piece of story and lore as you move around finding echoes to learn more about what things were like hundreds of years ago, and it just adds a lot of character. The only thing I will say, I suppose, is that it's odd that these chambers are just, like, only on Kobo. Why weren't they built elsewhere? The High Republic spanned across plenty of planets, why are they only on this one? I suppose it's because they're framed as training rooms for young Jedi, but even still, it does feel a tad forced that they're only coming across these now, and that they're also right in plain sight. Not even slightly hidden in a lot of cases, and I was under the impression the High Republic was sort of a forgotten era. Although, I guess maybe actually I'm getting the High Republic mixed up with the Old Republic there, so I think I actually just figured that out right now, and I'm an idiot, and I was wrong. Look, it's hard to keep up with all of these names for different eras, all right? Especially when a lot of them aren't fleshed out in Star Wars canon currently. A few dozen Disney Plus shows for each, and I, I, I might have a better grasp on it, I think. There's a whole ton of smaller side stuff to engage with as well. Like I said before, fishing, collecting music for the saloon, farming and growing plants, but I think the most fun I had with something minor was Hollow Tactics. The game functions as a hollow game in which you and an opponent pitch enemies against each other. You begin with a particular amount of points, and then you use those points to spend on placing down types of fighters. These fighters are based on the enemies you've scanned within the game while you're out fighting, and so the tougher enemies that you've beaten and scanned, the tougher enemies you can use in hollow tactics. Once placed down, the game will simulate a battle between the AI, and whoever comes out on top wins. It's not a deep game, or really a game with any sort of skill involved, more so a matter of strategy and luck in a lot of cases, but I found it to be incredibly fun to choose your fighters and then watch them duke it out in the hopes that you'll come out on top and win a reward. It's not Gwent or Machine Strike, and it's incredibly shallow, but it is fun, and sometimes that's really all you need. The last thing to spend your time doing is to collect things. Lots of different things. As you move around, you'll pick up these crystals, and in doing so, you'll be rewarded with either Life Essence, increasing your base HP, Force Essence, increasing your base Force Meter, or Perks, which will enable small boosts to the base stats to build out your version of Kalmore, which, while not incredibly deep, is a nice addition, which I could see being built upon in the future to give way more agency to the player and how they choose their character to be played. As it stands, though, I didn't really bother with the perks all that much. I just threw on some that I liked the look of and just kind of went to town. The rest of the stuff you're going to be picking up is all revolving around the customization in the game, and boy, have they upgraded that. Fallen Order had you able to customize Cal with different ponchos, as well as changing lightsaber components and the color of BD-1 and the Mantis. This game removes Mantis customization, which is a shame, but adds so much more. As you explore the planets, you'll come across particular valuables to particular vendors throughout the game. Data discs are for Z, Priorite shards for Doma, and Jedi Scrolls for Sister Task. By collecting these items, you're able to trade them with these particular vendors for customization items. Don't ask why Doma is selling hair. 
I couldn't tell you, but it's definitely not as weird as finding a beard in a chest, that's for sure. Despite the fact that there is work to do on contextualizing these items, what is here is so plentiful and you can really make Cal your own. I went through a few styles and felt like I could match Cal's hair and beard to the point of the story and it sort of reflected his character arc, which I felt was part of the fun. That said, I do wonder if the third game will let us import our save, or maybe choose our look for Cal from the very start as to not have him revert to the default look and make it feel inconsistent with how maybe we finish Jedi Survivor. I don't know, I guess we'll see on that front. Outfits as well have been given a ton of depth. No longer is it just a wide assortment of ponchos, but all outfits with different parts to each piece of clothing. Shirts, jackets, pants, and the colours of all of them, so you can really mix and match and give your Cal the look that you want, which I played around with extensively, altering his outfit for the planet we were visiting just to make things feel even more grounded and immersive. From Jedi outfits to that jacket that Luke wore that one time at the end of A New Hope, there's plenty of bits and bobs here to sink your teeth into. Light Sabers, though, is where the customization system shines. I spent far too much time, far too much time customizing my lightsaber in this game. There are so many different variables, from the material to the polish to the condition of the weapon. You've got tons and tons of different parts that you can customize out, and it just it's just so fun. I cannot tell you the joy that this brings me. I think it scratches some sort of itch for everyone who loved Star Wars as a kid. I don't know about you, but did you ever have one of those customize your own lightsaber toy things when you were a kid that like came with a few different parts and you could sort of like assemble it how you wanted to? There wasn't a lot of variation, but it was really fun. And this game, I think, does that, but like just to an insane extent. It just really scratches is that itch. I just, oh man, it's fun. I'm just editing this video and I completely forgot to even mention in my script that you can customize BD-1 and your blaster for your blaster stance. I don't really have too much to say on it. It's as cool as the lightsaber stuff, although I guess not quite as cool because customizing a lightsaber is always going to be cooler than customizing a gun or a little robot guy, but I still think that it's really nice and I'm interested to see where they take the customization moving forward in the next game for sure. I think all in all the way that the game uses all of its side content is mainly to ground you in spaces that you get to explore. Kobo remains the absolute best planet for this, where all of the side content just comes together to make the planet live and breathe. It can feel a bit lacklustre in other locations like Jeddah or the Shattered Moon. It struggles to bake the side content into the immersion of those locations, and could have done with reverting maybe more to what they did in Fallen Order's design, rather than forcing them to conform to the similar work they did with Kobo. Don't get me wrong, the Shattered Moon is not the worst offender here, it's mainly Jeddah, and I, I'm sorry for hating on Jeddah so much, I, I do apologize. I really don't hate it that much. Overall though, it's good. I enjoyed it. This stuff was a wonderful step up from Fallen Order and I can only see them taking it further. None of this stuff though would really be anything without the contextual glue holding it all together. The story, character work, and themes that make this game tick and tear it away from just being a regular old Souls-like. We talked about the opening of the game, but it's about time we get to the nitty gritty of this thing. The thing that tears both Fallen Order and Survivor away from any other generic Souls-like game is its story and its use of themes, specifically within the context of the Star Wars universe. I'm a big storytelling fan, I mean that sounds dumb, who isn't a big storytelling fan, but what I mean is it's the main thing that I think I'm good at. I try my best to break down mechanics and systems, and I think I'm getting a lot better at that aspect of the video writing process, but it's writing where I have the most of my experience, and so I find myself gravitating towards that aspect of critique more often. Like I said, this game works as a direct sequel to Fallen Order, and so the events of that game are of direct consequence to this one. This is a good start because it means everything has a purpose. The destruction of the Holocron, which was the culmination of Cal's arc at the end of that game, plays directly into this one. The gang stayed together for a while, but eventually they split up, going off and finding a new purpose. Cal, though, did not. The Cal we see at the start of Survivor is a far more capable and headstrong Cal than the weaker and more feeble Cal we see in Fallen Order. However, he's reckless, he's pushing himself, and he's somewhat coming apart at the seams. He's been fighting the Empire for five years, and Fallen Order was already five years after Order 66, so at this point the Empire has been in control of the galaxy for ten years. Ten years is a long time. Think back to ten years ago in your own life. I was 16, listening to One Direction and embarrassing myself in front of girls on Facebook Messenger. This is a real me message, this is real, that's me, I, I said that. Um... If, the, if this was you, 
I'm just, I'm sorry about that. I just needed to get this out of my system. I don't know why I'm showing you this. And much like I am getting symptoms of post-traumatic stress now, Cal exhibits much the same across his journey in this game. There's a very important theme here, which is reinforced by the ending, but we'll touch upon that in a little bit. Cal is desperately trying to find a reason to go on, a purpose, something that makes his life mean something, and being raised a Jedi and spending informative years hiding on Bracca, and then, for the first time, finding a family with the Mantis crew, he finds it very hard to do anything but fight. It's all he knows, from a young age, being trained as a Jedi during the Clone Wars, to being an adult during the reign of the Empire. He's stuck. After arriving on Kobo and seeking out Grease, we stumble into a High Republic site, which I will say, is a huge coincidence. If the Mantis hadn't broken and we hadn't been close to Kobo and Grease didn't have a saloon on top of a High Republic site, none of the story would have happened. And so the events of the plot are happening out of sheer dumb luck, which I would say is a bit of a cardinal sin of writing. But the reason I'll let it slide here is because what it does is enable growth and self-reflection more than it enables a story that's deeply interesting. This story is about Cal as a person far more than it's about what Cal is actually doing. One of the biggest criticisms is that Cal was far too flat in Fallen Order. Well, Survivor works to build in some incredible depth, raising this character to a place where I can say he's probably one of the more interesting Star Wars characters. Cal discovers Z, an old High Republic droid, and with her, memories of a Jedi called Centauri Kree. From this, he discovers a planet called Tanalor, which exists through a seemingly unnavigable region of space known as the Kobo Abyss. However, this planet on the other side would be completely out of reach of the Empire. And after looking into this exact thing, Cal ends up releasing a former friend of Santari Kree turned dark side user Dagon Gera, who is also searching for Tanalor. He desired to use Tanalor as a home for a Jedi temple in which they could train young initiates, but with the Jedi Council pushing back on the idea in the invasion of the Nile, Nihil? Nihil? I don't know what that is. I don't think they say that out loud at all, at any point. Nihil, or Nihil. Let's go with Nihil. I'm only going to say it one more time in this video, so it doesn't really matter anyway. The invasion of the Nihil was being ignored, and the Jedi were refusing to counterattack. Dagon's desire soon became an obsession, which saw him turn against the Jedi and imprisoned until later Cal lets him loose 200 years later. I don't think Dagon's story is all that compelling to learn about, and he's honestly not that interesting as an antagonist. He sort of just feels like a nuisance more than anything, which is a shame, and I don't truly understand his motives. I mean, he just sort of wanted to train Jedi and when the council said no, he went evil, which is honestly kind of classic Star Wars. I don't know if we've ever had a truly compelling dark side user that went evil for genuinely realistic and reasonable reasons. I feel like the nature of the dark side leads it to be kind of ridiculous as a concept to even justify. Oh yeah, guys, I was having a rough time. My mental health just got to me, and so I turned to the dark side. If you're turning to something called the dark side, then you must have already had mental issues to begin with, is all I'm saying. What Dagon works as in actuality is a mirror for Cal, but on top of that, so are Ravis and Bode. Tanalor works as a plot device to explore Cal's search for purpose and how much he's potentially going to get lost in the source on this journey. The main issue here is that the plot aspects that are actually unimportant are given a lot of gravitas. We find a High Republic Jedi who's gone rogue. That sounds incredibly intriguing. But what it ultimately ends up being is an enemy for Cal to race against to find the Tanalor key, without presenting anything meaningful to the storyline in the meanwhile. Meaning that you could have replaced Dagon Gera with someone less extraordinary and got across the same theming they tried to do with Dagon. I think the reason so many people feel disappointed with story aspects of this game is because you expect the fact that they're from the High Republic to actually mean something narratively. But it doesn't mean anything, other than giving a reason for Tanalor to remain undetected. But you could have written something else in to explain that, and scrapped the concept of the High Republic, because that context ends up being inconsequential, and it's actually damaging to the overall plot. People are going to be focusing on the fact that they're from the High Republic and thinking that's integral to the story, whereas it's actually got nothing to do with anything other than to explain what Tanalor is. Dagon being from the High Republic doesn't mean anything. Dagon's purpose in our story is for Kalzark alone. But this is the thing that is executed well. 
Dagon works as a mirror to Cal by showing insight into a man who's lost everything, even himself in the pursuit of this planet. It became his purpose, he couldn't see anything but this, and with the Nihil continuing to attack them, that's the last time I say that word, he felt it was all he could do to fight back and do what was right, which saw him lose himself in the end. Ravis is Dagon's bodyguard slash mate slash slave, and while he's a much more minor character, his extended life and devotion to Dagon for the last few hundred years speaks to a dedication to something that maybe he doesn't even believe in, but is willing to die for anyway. He's lived this way for so long that he cannot change, he can't see purpose outside of his current life, he doesn't know anything else. And ultimately, he's surrendered to his fate. His only escape at this point is death, mirroring Cal's situation, stuck knowing only one thing, fighting against the Empire, and fighting so recklessly that Maybe he's surrendered to the idea that this is how he's going to die. And finally, Bode works to show us a Jedi fallen to the dark side in the hopes of protecting the only thing left in the galaxy that he cares about, his daughter. And in doing so, he pushes her away and loses himself in the end. Yet another mirror to Cal's sense of belonging, guiding his actions to find Tanalor. But not just that, because what Bode does is allow for a nuanced approach and look at the dark side. Dagon represents a more traditional view of a dark side user, a Sith, the way that the Jedi of old would have classified them, the way that Cal sees a dark side user, but Bode is different. He doesn't fit into this very neat binary that the Jedi decided existed of light and dark, and so it opens that door to allow us to see that the dark side doesn't mean you just turn evil. You can tap into the dark side, you can use the dark side, you can even fall to the dark side, without being a bad person. And it's that nuance of the Force that allows the story to work so well, and allow for Cal's arc to actually flourish. He doesn't want to lose people, he doesn't want to lose himself, but the path he's heading down is causing him to come face to face with these three different antagonists, all of which foreshadow potential outcomes for Cal if he doesn't pull back and gain a bit of self-awareness. And this is why the general plot of Survivor can at times feel flat, because it's utilised for character growth, not for genuine intrigue, but decides on a plot that is genuinely incredibly interesting, only to go and use it for character growth. I never really gave a shit about Tanalor or even Santari Kree, but I did care about what it meant for Cal or for his friends, for his mental state. Those things were deeply important to me, and that's why I kept playing. I wanted Cal to find a sense of purpose and belonging, but as you play, you start to see that Cal is focusing maybe too hard, a trait he's all too familiar with, and it's causing a rift between him and his ideals. We see Cal over the course of the game attempt to get the gang back together, first with Grease, then with Merrin, and finally with Seer. Grease accepts right away, Merrin takes some time, and Seer flat out always refuses. Getting everyone back on the Mantis is Cal trying desperately to hold on to the semblance of belonging and outright sanity he had during that period, despite continuing to fight the Empire and seeing that as his only option. The love he felt being around these people is something he's trying to chase, a feeling of safety. The fact that Seer outright disagrees every time he asks is showing the fact that Cal needs to face this. He's trying so hard to band-aid his wounds that stem all the way back from Order 66 ten years ago, with his old crew, with this idea of Tanalor, with his fight against the Empire. We see this moment upon leaving the Lugahulk with Bode, Cal is forced into an escape pod, and it's never outright said, but you can see him reliving the moment his master died as they left the Venator during the Purge. Despite the fact that he's let go of the guilt he feels from that moment, like we see in Fallen Order, the pain and trauma doesn't just vanish. That remains and will always remain with him, and if he's going to come out on top, he has to confront that rather than run from it. Merrin is the one light in Cal's life at this point, something that is not a tie to the old world and his old life, but to the new. She is the same as he is. They say as much during the game. When we first met, I thought that what we shared was unique. Survivors fighting together against the Empire who took our families. Yeah. You helped me realize I wasn't alone. As did you. But where Mirren has gone off, found herself, and is content with her loss, Cal is not. He's buried it deep down, and it's eating away. Merrin tries her best to help him, to be the support system he needs, but even she struggles here, because nobody can truly help Cal but himself. The themes here are of loss, of belonging, and of purpose. The war against the Empire, the High Republic, Dagon Gera, Ravis, they're all just backdrops in this game, distractions from the war Cal is having internally, and all of that comes together within the climax of the game's story. The climax point begins during the assault on Jeddah. 
I guessed early on, like I said, Bob was a traitor, but what I didn't guess was that he was a fallen Jedi. That really shocked me when he hits Cal with the force push. My jaw dropped because it totally recontextualized his character within the context of the character journey, and so it worked incredibly well. Having Bode murder Cordova as well just worked to better solidify him as an antagonist in this late stage of the game. I will take a moment to say I think all three, Dagon, Bode, and Ravis, are incredibly shallow. Not in their potential, just in how they're explored. It could have been nice to have at least kept one around for the next game to explore them in depth more and make me feel something, but same as Triller and Fallen Order, the idea of them is way more interesting than the execution, and ultimately, they just act as an evil foil for Cal to fight against against and Propeller's character journey more so than having any sort of interesting commentary in and of themselves. Now, once Cal is knocked out by Bode, we switch perspectives to a set piece featuring Seer Junda. Taking control of Seer was a very cool moment, however, I did know as soon as I started playing as her what they were about to do. I'm not sure whether it was just me being big brained or whether it was totally obvious, but it was inevitable for me that at that point Darth Vader was going to make another appearance. This is a double-edged sword for me. I think it's pretty obvious they wanted another Vader cameo because it was such a killer moment in the first game that to have another would be cool as well, and I'm sure for most Star Wars fans, it was really cool to see Vader, but part of me feels it was a little bit cheap to just retread that cool moment from the first game. I will say though, if you were going to do it again, how they did it was probably the right way. Having Seer come face to face with him after everything that happened with Trilla and in Fortress Inquisitorius, now that Seer has grappled with the dark side and won, her facing off against the poster boy for the dark side and the one responsible for her original struggle makes perfect sense, and the fact she's able to go toe to toe with Vader for a brief period is also very thematically appropriate. But despite this, despite it working on a thematic level and on a character level and even on a lore level, I can't shake the feeling that I could have done without it. It feels gratuitous even if it's not, and with the state of Star Wars and its incessant cameos, you can't blame me for feeling that way about this moment. I think this feeling is a symptom less of these games themselves, and more of how Vader's been used in other extended media since the original trilogy. The fight itself, though, is incredibly marvellous. I struggled here for a while, but it was so much fun. The attack patterns, the imposing nature of Vader, the music, the arena, this was genuinely my favourite fight in the game on a mechanical level, and I feel that's because they make you play as Seer, and so they can fine-tune both the boss and the player character to perfectly balance the fight, which makes it incredibly strong. There is no cheesing this fight, there is no using your skill tree to get an upper hand. You have to use the skills that Seer has to win this fight. It's all about just getting good. And it took me a while. Of course, though, Seer is killed by Vader at the end of this fight, as she has to be. But the fact that she held out for so long, the fact that she was able to hold her own against Vader and damage him somewhat, is a testament to her arc across Fallen Order and this game. Her confrontation with the Dark Side is something she came out on top of. And despite the fact that she died, because of course she has to die, it goes to show that you can win against the Dark Side. Cal rushes in to Holder, another of his masters, a mentor, someone he loved and cared for, dying in his arms. Again. This is a turning point for Cal. This moment here causes everything that's been bubbling just below the surface to boil over. He's been betrayed by Bode. He stole the compass to the thing he's dedicated himself to finding. Seer is dead, Cordova is dead. And so Cal heads to find Bode on Nova Garen. This is where a lot of people feel the game sort of goes a bit wobbly, a bit mispaced, and while I do somewhat agree, I think what the game is actually trying to do isn't the same as what maybe people were expecting the game to do. I've seen people say that the High Republic story is sidelined, it never becomes a truly satisfying conclusion because you murder Dagon pretty early on and then the focus becomes bowed and it all happens a bit fast and suddenly the entire story focus has changed, but I disagree there. Sure, the backdrop has changed, what Cal is doing has changed, the story about Centauri Kree and Dagon Gera is dropped, but that wasn't actually the story, that was just the plot. The difference being, plot is what's happening, story is what it's about, and the story in this game is all about Cal Kestis and his personal journey. They use Dagon to explore that journey, but once Cal reaches a point where he almost agrees with Dagon, Maybe Dagon was right. You sure you're not still, uh, you know? <clears throat> Think about it. Tantalor's a fortress. We should use it for the hidden path. Gather allies, train. They'd never see us coming. 
they kill him off to be able to move on to another focus which allows for the core theming to continue. Do I think everything from killing Dagon to the end of the game is perfectly paced though? No, I don't. I think it could use a lot of work to really be perfect, but what I think it does manage to do is at every step highlight the themes of the game incredibly strongly. When Cal kills Dagon, he almost takes over his position. The search for Tanalor has taken over him a decent bit to the point where he can't even see what's coming, and he pays for it. Heading to find Bode, we get to see Cal really lose himself, given to the dark side. First with the Imperial officer who ordered Bode to spy on them, and then again when Bode escapes with Carter. Cal even calls him a monster right in front of his daughter. You were going to give it to the Hidden Path. A, a, a bunch of strangers. And you were going to sacrifice thousands of people to save yourself. Or a monster boat. Cal is so hurt to his core at this point. Cal is so tired of losing, so tired of being tricked and beaten and having all of his actions be futile, and he gives in to the dark side. And once you let that in, it's one hell of a thing to try and push out again. Without his master, without Seer, without Cordova, Cal is left alone again to try and navigate this on his own. Arriving on Tanalor after doing some satellite shit, we confront Bode. Bode ends up losing everything in his quest for Tanalor. He lost himself in the process, and all of that stems, like Carter tells us, from the death of his wife. A great loss that caused him to seek purpose. Purpose he of course found in needing to keep his daughter safe, but in finding that purpose and chasing it like a wild dog, he lost himself in the process, and his daughter pays for it. Cal and Merrin try to reason with Bode, reminding him what loss has done to them, not to force Carter to go through the same thing by forcing them to kill him. But he doesn't listen. He truly has lost himself and they have to fight. In defeating Bode in what is a very well constructed multi-phase boss fight, Cal gives him another chance. To give in and not to put this on his daughter. Don't put this on your daughter. Bode, we know what it's like to grow up alone. Please, listen to them, Papa! Alright. And when the Empire comes, Will you be able to protect my little girl? <gasps> I'm sorry, Carter. I tried. And after almost killing Merrin, Cal doesn't give him another chance. He shoots him once, and then waits, glances over at Merrin, and then again, to make sure the job's done. That pause in between the two shots, the pause even before the first shot, shows deep intent. It's not just a reaction, self-defense, impulsive, especially not for a Jedi with lightning-fast reflexes. That was something Cal thought about and decided needed to be done. Something he wanted to do because of what Bode might have done to Merrin. And it's subtle, but it plays into Cal's tapping into the dark side. His base emotions and impulses are controlling him more and more. And I think it hits especially harder after knowing the Cal from the first game and seeing that loss of innocence across the time with him in Jedi Survivor. Every other time throughout the game, Cal is confronted with having to kill someone. It's framed very, very differently. This is where the themes come full circle with this conversation Merrin has with Carter. When my mother died, it changed Papa. And me too, I guess. Yes. But it doesn't have to define you. And you must not let it consume you. Trauma and loss don't have to define you, and you cannot let it consume you. This is the struggle Cal now has to face. Merrin says these words to Carter as a precaution and as a kindness to her, but also because she can see what loss has done to Cal. It did consume him, but will he continue to let it define him? After Merrin finishes this sentence, the game implies this heavily, with a reverse shot to reveal Cal in the shadows as he enters the Mantis, with the music becoming somewhat ominous.
The following and final scene of the game has the three of them stand before the burning bodies of Seer, Cordova, and Bode. As they stand, the shot becomes a time lapse, with Cal unmoving, staring, dwelling, and thinking. This is such a powerful ending. Cal speaks to Seer one last time, and his words speak to a struggle that he's going to have to fight against. Cal doesn't want to lose himself, but the devotion to building something to outlast the Empire above all else, his desire to see it through, could be his undoing. And as he walks past the camera, the bright and hopeful Force theme slowly and subtly turns darker, signifying an uncertain future for our protagonist. As Seer appears as a Force apparition, she speaks only one single thing, to guide her through the darkness. And as Cal walks away, the camera pans to show Seer's lightsaber in the mud, as Cal leaves and the game comes to a close. This is one of the most powerful endings to any piece of Star Wars media of all time. I mean that. The idea of the Jedi and the Sith, or the Rebellion and the Empire, or just the nature of the Force, allows for stories that speak to the morality of humanity, of people, and of the human condition. Star Wars thrives when it focuses on these elements because, at the heart of the magic and fantasy and sci-fi, are very real stories that uncover things about us as people. Cal's journey is one that so many have faced and will face in the future, and the way it's portrayed as so authentic, so earnest, and so vulnerable are things that we rarely see in Star Wars these days. A true grapple with a darker side of yourself that feels so hard to beat, a trauma that molds who you are without consulting you first, and inner demons you have to beat at all costs. This is why, despite the pacing issues and the plot being pretty incidental, I think the game shines, because the character themes are impeccable. And this is where we come back around to the question of, why Dark Souls? The direct themes of Jedi Survivor are in line with the gameplay loop and mechanics of the Souls-like model. Cal is fighting a futile fight, but refuses to give up, and that's true of his battle against the Empire on the surface and his battle against the Dark Side within himself. He lost his master, he lost Cordova, he lost Seer. Cal keeps losing, but he keeps getting back up and trying again. He doesn't fail like Dagon, he doesn't give in like Ravis, and he doesn't throw away his family like Bode. Jedi Survivor, as an extension of Jedi Fallen Order, is a direct examination of the futility one must fight on the battlefield and in the mind. And that is one of the most incredible uses of the Souls formula. It's paying homage to the game it's taking inspiration from, but it's done in a way that stays true to Star Wars and to Cal Kestis. And this is why I can't help but overlook so many of the flaws. Sure, the extrinsic events happening and guiding our character journey could and should be better. There is plenty I'd change on that front, but it's what the game has to say that is just fantastic. I shed a tear in that final cutscene because I just felt so strongly, and I empathised with Cal Kestis on such a deep level that it had an emotional effect on me, and part of that comes from the marrying of gameplay and narrative themes. This game's strength is in how it uses the great character work of our supporting cast, the setups and backstory of the first game, the tiny little character moments sprinkled throughout Survivor and the mirroring of each major antagonist, culminating in a finale that focuses so heavily on who Cal Kestis is at his core. I cannot wait to see what they do in the third game, and I hope they give us a satisfying conclusion to the character arc Cal has been on. And if it's anything like this, then the Star Wars Jedi trilogy is going to be one of the best Star Wars trilogies ever made. Now you're just bought. Let's go. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. This video was really fun to work on. I really enjoy writing this script. It's been really nice. It was quite therapeutic. I didn't even think I'd make a video on Jedi Survivor. I wasn't even looking forward to Jedi Survivor, and then I played it. I think it's probably my game of the year. Will it remain game of the year? I mean, probably not. But the fact that it's there at all is kind of mad. If you want to help support me in making videos like this in the future, the best place you can do that 
is as always over on patreon.com forward slash lasers which is linked down in the description there's a bunch of different rewards for different tiers so if you want to check it out go and check it out there's plenty of stuff you can get back plenty of bonus content early access stuff like that at the same time you're going to be supporting me in making videos like this and you know everything else i do on the channel so i appreciate everybody over there thank you so much i love you you are the best patrons that in the world honestly i love you so much and thank you very much to our patreon producers tj flash paradox ethan damien the not so orange gnome connor seed or sam is paying james's water bill carl frederick wibro cabbage and readathon thank you so much for that future james i appreciate you reading out the names because I don't have them here right now. I've got plenty of stuff to come in the future. Plenty of stuff. we got a few things we're going to be working on. Biggest of all this year, Red Dead Redemption 2 Retrospective. That is coming up. It is coming up. I've got a few other projects um, in the wings that I'm waiting to work on. I don't know which ones are going to end up happening, which ones are not going to end up happening. Every time I talk about them, I'm like, I get people that are like, oh yeah, that's going to be so good. And then I'm like, I just don't have time for it anymore. Um, because they just, they do take a while to make. But we've still got half a year left. A little bit over half a year um so plenty of time to do bits and bits and bobs i think also for those asking about uh assassin's creed 4 retrospective i know lots of people that are asking probably won't sit through the outro i don't know how many people do sit through the outro um but i am gonna make one i think i'm pretty sure i'm gonna make one but it'll probably be early next year i reckon that's the plan um, because next year is also the five year anniversary of persona 5 royal and my plan is to make a big like the biggest critique analysis retrospective of persona 5 royal next year and i know that a lot of my audience maybe it's not their sort of thing but i need to do it for my own benefit i just need to do it all right and my idea is i'm going to do a lot of cool little videos this year well big videos and then start off next year with a ac4 video that i'm very confident will perform well so that i can then spend like six months working on a persona 5 royal retrospective which i want to make the best i possibly can so there's that it might benefit me to do that. It might not, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> but that's it for me. Hit the link in the description. Go check out these glasses. If you want to pick yourselves up some. I actually, I really like them. I like them a lot, actually. They're, they're cool. Anyway, thank you all so much for the continued support. Thank you so much. I love you all for watching my stuff. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I um, hope you enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts on Jedi Survivor. I'll see you next time, buddy. Bye. That's two salutes. Yeah, what am I doing? Goodbye!